So good morning, uh, everybody, and uh, good good evening for François Ampas, which, which is in uh, in Rio, so it's very late for him. So thank you for being with us. So François is currently an assistant professor at the Physics Institute of the Federal University of uh, Rio de Janeiro in Brazil. He was graduated from the Ecole Polytechnique uh, in France in uh, 2001, and he holds a Master of Science of Electrical uh, engineering from MIT in 2004. And in 2008, he obtained his PhD at uh, Ecole Polytechnique in Paris, and at the same time, at the Paris Observatory in the field of uh, atom optics and application to metrology, such as uh, clock, uh, atomic uh, sensor, or gravimeter in particular. From uh, 2008 to 2010, he was a postdoc at the Federal University of Rio in the group of uh, Luis uh, Davidovich. And in 2011, he uh, obtained a position of uh, as a research associate in CNRS in France. And in 2013, he joined the faculty uh, of uh, John, uh, the faculty of the Federal University of Rio de Janeiro as a theoretical physicist. Uh, his currently uh, research interests include physics of quantum fluctuation, atom optics, and quantum control and in particular also uh, dynamical Casimir effect, which is the talk uh, that you're going to present to us today. So thank you for being with us. The floor is yours. Okay, thank you, David, for the invitation and uh, for the nice uh, introduction. Uh, can you, you can hear me well? Huh? I think yes, yeah. yes, no problem. So in case the uh, uh, internet fails, please tell me, and I have a backup plan here to well, I hope that it will not uh, fail. Okay, well, uh, today uh, I will talk about uh, dynamical Casimir effects uh, with the parole. Uh, and uh, we'll see two different kinds of effects. Uh, first, the, the emission of photon pairs, which is the usual sense uh, that people give to the Casimir, dynamical Casimir effect. But also we'll see uh, geometric atomic phases, uh, in, in this talk, I will explain to you how the dynamical motion of boundaries in the, uh, in the quantum field can cause, uh, can induce this kind of effect. So this work was done with, uh, jointly with, uh, it's a long-standing collaboration with uh, Renato de Melo de Souza, with a professor uh, at the Federal University of, uh, at the UFI, Universidad mm -hmm. Federal Finance. Uh, Guillermo Costamatos was a PhD student who did part of his, his work, and uh, Paulo Mayanet, who is uh, a professor at the uh, Federal University of Rio. Well, uh, okay, there are three main parts, but first I will give you a short introduction on uh, dynamical Casimir effect and on non inertial effects. Well, non inertial effects are, uh, have been for a long time a fascinating subject for physicists. Uh, taking, for instance, the Mach conjecture, uh, Ernst Mach, uh, for Ernst Mach, what gives the non-inertiality non of a frame is the relative motion with uh, the distant uh, uh, mass distribution. So, in other words, for Mach, uh, if you spin, if you wheel around the distant stars, of course, it is a, a fictitious experiment. You, 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 no one can do this in practice, but if you imagine that you have an inertial frame and suddenly the stars begin to uh, turn, to wheel, to spin. Then for Mach, uh, this will give uh, some non-inertiality to the frame. So the non-inertial non feature of, of the frame would be related to the uh, uh, motion of the uh, large scale mass distribution. More recently, in connection with the quantum uh, vacuum physics this time, uh, there is a very interesting effect which was uh, predicted by Benon Roux in the 70s and which now uh, bears his name, which is, a, uh, which is the following. If you have an in a frame in which you have no light, no photons, no radiation, and you put an observer in this, in this frame, if the observer accelerates, he will perceive the presence of radiation. So in other words, the quantum vacuum is not invariant under an acceleration. So this is an example of a uh, connection between uh, non-inertiality and quantum vacuum physics. And another example, which I will uh, talk uh, more about uh, in this presentation, is the dynamical Casimir effect. Uh, and this, in the usual sense, uh, 
it is the following. If you uh, have a boundary, for instance, a mirror, and if you uh, have a fast oscillation of this boundary, this is a boundary for the quantum field, for the electromagnetic field. Then uh, the oscillation of this boundary will uh, induce the production of uh, real photons. So you, you will have the production, the production of photon pairs by the motion uh, of the boundary. Of course, this motion has to be fast. And uh, in this cartoon, you see that um, uh, the person is shaking a box. And when you, talk, when you open the box, he gets uh, an explosion of, of radiation. Uh, in practice, uh, this experiment is not so dangerous because you have very few photons produced. And it's actually a problem to detect this effect. Because the difficulty is that to produce a significant number of photon pairs, the motion has to be very fast. Uh, it has to be uh, a fraction of the relativistic speed. Uh, and uh, it is naturally very difficult, if not impossible, to achieve relativistic speeds with uh, macroscopic bodies. Uh, so uh, this effect was predicted by Moore in the 70s. And since then, you have a series of papers which describe the dynamical Casimir effect. And here I have put some uh, more recent reviews on this subject. Uh, a way to put this, a more technical way, is to say that you have a parametric amplification of the vacuum fluctuations. What I mean is the following. Uh, in the simplest model of dynamical Casimir effect, if you take a 1D model, you have a boundary, which is a perfect reflector, let's say. And uh, you have uh, the field in the vacuum states. And you have a decomposition of modes. And uh, for instance, if you take a mode uh, which, is, which has a frequency omega in, for incident, and you have a, an oscillation of your boundary at the frequency uh, omega cm for the center of mass motion, the mechanical frequency, then you will have uh, two sidebands which appear. And uh, in some way, the associating mirror works as an acoustic optic modulator for the quantum field. And technically, what happens is that you have a mixing between the positive and negative frequencies. And this uh, mixing results in the fact that if you take the vacuum field, you will have the production of photon pairs uh, because, of the, because of this uh, mixing induced by the uh, mirror motion. So the dynamical Casimir effect uh, predicts the production of uh, photon pairs uh, from the quantum vacuum. And uh, as I said, the difficulty, uh, ex the experimental challenge is that you need to be very fast with the motion of the boundary. And a very nice trick was, uh, uh, was uh, followed uh, a bit more than 10 years ago by uh, a group in Sweden, in Sweden. And instead of using uh, a physical motion, they use an effect, the motion of a, an effective boundary condition. And they were able to tune very fast uh, the variation of this effective boundary condition in the squid, in the superconducting waveguide. And uh, by doing this, by modulating this effective electric length, they were able to produce the equivalent of dynamical Casimir photons uh, with the uh, features of dynamical Casimir photons. So this is a very nice experiment, uh, actually. But in some way, it is still an analog model because you have no physical motion of the boundary. Uh, you have an effective boundary, which moves very fast, but you have not, no physical motion uh, of the body. So uh, the question is, if we can go beyond that, if it is possible to capture, to measure, uh, uh, a dynamical Casimir effect with uh, that, that comes from a, uh, the real motion of a physical boundary. And uh, for this purpose, uh, one can think to use atoms to probe the, to probe the quantum vacuum. Because it is the following. Uh, actually, if you want to detect directly the emitted photon pairs, uh, uh, this will be most likely an impossible task because you will. Uh, only achieve non-relativistic speeds with the uh, physical uh, motion of this boundary. So uh, the you have very, very few photons emitted. But maybe, I say maybe, uh, this motion leaves a trace as an atomic phase. And maybe we can detect this atomic phase, which is uh, an indirect signature of the dynamical Casimir effect. And atom interferometric uh, devices are, are, are very precise. No? So uh, we have some hope to use uh, atoms to detect signatures of the dynamical Casimir effect. So uh, a bit, a part of my talk will be dedicated, uh, dedicated to this, to investigate this. 
And uh, also, what is nice of uh, considering atom moving in the quantum vacuum is that you can somehow do a ab initio theory of uh, dynamical Casimir effect. The usual theory of dynamical Casimir effect uh, of the motion of, uh, the, uh, of, the, of the photon pairs induced by the motion of the, of the boundary. Uh, this usual computation uh, uses a macroscopic approach based on the mode of the fields. It's quite involved and complicated, but uh, you can, uh, with a very simple toy model at the atomic, at the atomic scale, uh, try to do an ab initio, a microscopic theory of this. And, and it uh, provides an access to universal properties uh, independent of the material of uh, the dynamical Casimir effect. So this is one of the uh, reasons to consider uh, atoms in the quantum vacuum. And finally, a final motivation uh, related to uh, the DCE and the non-relativistic regime is that uh, if you have fast spinning particles, you can uh, obtain something which is analog to a quantum Sagnac effect. So uh, we'll, we'll see uh, this effect for atomic waves. And here we'd like to mention in this slides uh, a related effect was different, which is a quantum friction that has, uh, for instance, in this paper, uh, the group of uh, Peter Bodek and Fernando Lombardo were investigating uh, the effect of the atomic motion in terms of quantum friction. It's, it is different from what we're doing, but it's, it is again a, a, a case in which you probe quantum vacuum physics with uh, a moving atom. And the motivation also for this work is that uh, you have recent progresses in experiment in the fast rotation of nanoparticles, and uh, specifically in two groups, the group of uh, Tong Kang and Li and the group of uh, Lucas Novotny. Uh, these people were able to uh, achieve gigahertz frequency of rotations uh, in the angular frequency of rotation uh, with nanoparticle. And this gives us some hope to probe uh, non-inertial effects related to the uh, rotation of the boundary instead of the oscillation. So uh, now I will pass to the uh, microscopic dynamical effect. So as I said, you consider an in mirror, but in the end, the mirror is made out of uh, atoms and let us consider a single atom and see what are the photons emitted by this atom. So we'll take the simplest quantum mechanical model, a two level atom with a ground state and an excited state separated by uh, a frequency uh, omega zero. And we assume that this atom has a prescribed harmonic motion in which the position follows this uh, simple oscillation uh, at a frequency, which is uh, a mechanical frequency, which is omega CM here. And here we will somehow forget uh, uh, about the quantum mechanical aspects of the wave function and so on, the external atomic degrees of freedom, uh, which, which is to say the atomic position will be treated in a classical manner. But the internal degrees of freedom are, are treated quantum mechanically. So what will steer uh, the quantum system will be the external atomic motion here. And uh, you have two regimes uh, when you do this. Uh, if, you, if your frequency of oscillation is uh, larger than the transition frequency, then uh, your motion uh, can excite actually the atom. Uh, you have enough energy to excite the atom. But we will consider a different regime in which this mechanical frequency is smaller than uh, the, the transition frequency. And then you have no uh, excitation, but you have a two photon process, with, which is uh, here. And you have uh, two photons emitted, uh, which, as we shall see, whose uh, frequency will sum up to the mechanical frequency. So this is a regime that we will investigate. And uh, what is the model you use? We use uh, a simple dipolar interaction. And this is actually true for an atom at rest. So we have here the dipole operator uh, for the atom. Uh, we have the quantized electric field. And uh, this electric field is taken at the, uh, at the atomic position, so uh, the, which is the average expectation value of uh, the position operator. But we treat classically the, uh, the atomic position. OK, this is for an atom at rest. But if you have a moving atom, you need to be a bit more careful. And actually, you need to replace the electric field by the Lorentz transform field in the commoving frame. So you, you take the main non-relativistic order, and you obtain this. And when you put 
uh, this field back in the interaction here, so you use the prime here, you obtain the dipolar interaction for moving atom, and you have an additional term which is uh, coupled to the quantized magnetic field. So this term is called the Rolbigan term, and actually it is important to uh, take it into account if you want to uh, see uh, what, uh, what photons are emitting. Okay, now we start from initial state, which is uh, uh, the atom in the ground state and the field in the background state. And we seek to describe the creation of photon pairs. Uh, remember that the uh, dynamical Casimir effect is uh, the production of photon pairs. So we want to see how this happens with our atom. So uh, uh, if you want photon pairs, you can think, okay, we could go uh, to second order with this potential and actually it works. Uh, but you can use a, a simpler approach. Uh, you can actually obtain these photon pairs in the first order perturbation theory. And uh, it works as follows. Uh, remember that in the regime that we consider, uh, these frequencies are smaller than the uh, transition frequency, your atom is not excited. It will always stay at the ground state. And in this case, you can somehow forget about the internal atomic degrees of freedom and work with an Hamiltonian, which is only acting on the field. This was done by Passante uh, uh, for an atom at rest. Uh, and uh, actually, so you, uh, you uh, have this Hamiltonian for an atom at rest. It's a, it is a quadratic Hamiltonian in the field. Uh, here, this is a standard quantized field uh, in the box okay, with the creation operator, with the destruction operator and creation operators and so on. So you have something which is quadratic uh, in the field, and this is fine because a quadratic Hamiltonian in the field produces photon pairs. Uh, so we are uh, close to what we want. If the atom is moving, there is uh, a subtlety that you need to replace this field here by the uh, Lorentz transform field in the cool moving frame. So we'll have the equivalent of the Röntgen term that I mentioned before. This is what we have done. And you obtain this Hamiltonian, which is an effective Hamiltonian. Uh, and uh, here, this is a uh, polarizability of the atom, this alpha uh, at low frequency. And here, this, you have a mixing between the electric field and the magnetic field. Okay, I will spare you the details of this, uh, of this calculation. Uh, I just want to discuss the model and the result. And uh, this quadratic, as I said, so you have the creation of photon pairs. And if you go to uh, first order perturbation theory, then you can obtain your field state uh, as a vacuum state plus uh, a state which has uh, two, photon, two photon excitations. Um, so to first order, you obtain this. And uh, you can actually derive uh, these coefficients. Uh, and in the long time limit, the modes that are populated will satisfy the conservation of energy. So uh, you have the sum of frequencies, which is represented by this diagram here. OK, if you want to derive the probability of emissions and you compute this transition amplitude by standard mechanical uh, treatment, and uh, if you want to detect the probability of, the, of obtaining a photon in a given direction, you just have to sum over all possible second photons. This is as usual in quantum mechanics. If you don't measure something, you sum over all uh, possibilities. And uh, we have actually two possible modes, uh, which I will uh, explain here with this uh, graph. Uh, you have the direction of oscillation, which is given by this vector. And k is a wave vector, is the direction of emission. So you have a transverse electric mode electric mode in which the electric field is orthogonal to the plane defined by A, the oscillation of the atom in K as a wave vector. And you have a transverse magnetic mode uh, in which the polarization is, uh, the electric field is actually uh, in this plane and the uh, magnetic field would be uh, transverse. So these are the two possible modes of oscillation, of course, uh, the vectors are orthogonal to the wave vector K, okay, no? some convex modes. And now, uh, finally, I will discuss how we bridge uh, our, our microscopic theory with a macroscopic uh, result. So to do this, you will imagine that you have a series of atoms moving uh, identically, a collection of atoms put in this plane, because the mirror is a collection of atoms. And here, this is a very simple model. You, you have no interaction, no connectivity model, nothing, just a collection of atoms moving in the same, uh, in the same way. 
And you impose by end an additional condition, which is a, a condition of constructive interference. Because uh, when, you, when you do your theory with a, uh, with a single atom, you will have many modes populated. But if you consider an array of atoms with a macroscopic number, the only modes that which will be really populated and give uh, uh, will satisfy this condition, because this is a constructive interference condition, which is equivalent to the, transform, to the conservation of, uh, of uh, transverse momentum. So we impose by hand this condition to bridge our approach with the microscopic results. And when you do this, uh, we can compare our results with uh, the usual theory of dynamical Casimir effect. So uh, in the panel C and D, uh, this is actually the results ob obtained uh, by Paolo Maganetto uh, in the 90s and uh, Machado. And you see that we have very similar spectrum. We, we have a very similar angular distribution. This is angular distribution. And for the transverse electric mode, the preferred direction is the direction of oscillation. For the, here, we have the different frequencies. And in blue, these are frequencies of uh, close to the mechanical frequency. And in red, these are lower frequencies. So we have this preferred direction of, uh, of, of emission. And this is also true for the microscopic model. And for the transverse magnetic mode, uh, we have actually a dip. The direction of oscillation is not the prepared one. We have less emission in this direction. And, but uh, the emission diverges uh, when, you, uh, when you go far away, from, when you uh, go away from this direction. And we have the same thing which happens with our atom. We have a dip here. And uh, if you go, uh, the maximum emission is here in this cone. So uh, here actually you have a divergence because it is the uh, assumption of perfect material is not, uh, is not so realistic, but we have very similar features. Uh, and you see that if you go to lower frequencies, this uh, angular spectrum of emission is also uh, more isotropic. So we have shapes which are similar. And finally, you have in both cases, more transverse magnetic photons than uh, transverse electric photons. So, uh, these results are, are, have lots of um, similarities. And since then, uh, this microscopic theory has been uh, adapted and used in different ways. Uh, these papers have reformulated uh, this uh, theory with different uh, approaches. And uh, other papers have, have observed what, atom, what, what uh, happens when you see it on atom near a boundary. And uh, recently, uh, uh, it's not the complete reference here, but uh, here, uh, these people have obtained uh, reverse engineering uh, of, the, of, the, of the mirror in order to shape the dynamical Casimir photons produced by uh, the collection of atoms. So, uh, okay, this was the first part about this uh, microscopic theory of the dynamical Casimir effect. And now I would like to talk about a different effect. Uh, so the usual dynamical Casimir effect is the production of photon pairs, but now we'll see a dynamical Casimir-like effect, which is not exactly the production of photon pairs. You have no photon produced, but you have geometric atomic phases. So uh, why is it is dynamical-like? It is because this effect arises from the relative motion between the atom and uh, the surface. If you have a, a quasi-static treatment in which you freeze the atomic position, you will not obtain these phases. So, this is why it is really related to the uh, relative motion of these two objects, which um, uh, have dispersive interactions. So um, first of all, atomic phase are normally local. If you consider atomic interferometers, uh, I will do this in a, in an instant, they are normally local phase. But actually, as a consequence of this uh, dynamical Casimir-like dynamic -like Casimir effect, you can obtain some non-local phases. So this is the first uh, thing which is quite surprising for uh, people who are used with atomic interferometry, that you, you obtain non-local atomic phases. And also, uh, uh, this approach enables to, be, enables to bridge two different concepts, which is the concept of uh, electrodynamic retardation, the fact that the uh, interaction propagates at a finite speed between the atom and the surface, and the concept of quantum geometry of, of very phases and we'll see that these are actually two sides of the same coin in some way. Um, so um, after explaining this, uh, let us begin with a uh, standard description of atom interferometers. So 
you can have uh, interferometry, interferometry with atomic waves uh, as with uh, light waves. Uh, so there is a, a whole field of atomic interferometry which has uh, developed. And here we consider an atom interferometer on a Max Zender configuration. So a bit like an optical interferometer, you have a coherent superposition of two F packets, but you can assume that you have only one atom, but in a, co a coherent superposition of two F packets. We, we study single particle effect here. So this would be the initial state. And the way that you treat normally atomic interferometer, your quantum state uh, uh, is propagated uh, as follows. The wave packets acquire the phase and uh, on each pass, and the phase is given by an integral, which is done along the pass. This integral actually uh, is the integral of the action, a quantity called the mechanical action. But what matters is that this is a quantity that depends only on a single pass at a time. This is uh, uh, usually true for uh, Gaussian atomic wave packets. So this is a usual description of atomic interferometers, uh, as, for instance, established by uh, Christian Bordet. Uh, Two papers. Um, actually, this is a description that is used also in atomic interferometers that probe that are uh, testing and probing uh, dispersive interactions. In the group of uh, Cronin and the group of Jacques Viguet, you have uh, uh, an atom interferometric measurement of the Van der Waals forces. And you have actually this atom interferometer here in this figure. You have two paths a pass which goes through the number grating and which suffers influence of a surface and a dispersive interaction. And we have a second pass which goes uh, below. And uh, when the two paths meet, you can uh, you have a phase difference between the atomic wave, which goes on, on each pass. And this phase difference uh, related to this number grating here is given by an integral of the Van der Waals position, uh, potential. Okay, so this is a uh, description of Casimir interaction in the quasi static limit. In the, uh, so you have no dynamical effect here. But uh, if you go uh, a bit further in the quantum mechanical description, uh, it, uh, you, can, uh, you can explain things as follows. You still have your interaction Hamiltonian, which is a dipolar interaction. Uh, here, to simplify, uh, we'll ignore actually the random contribution. Uh, and uh, you have neutral atoms which are not polarized, so the average value is, uh, is zero. But of course, you have fluctuations. So they, uh, because of the fluctuation, you will have uh, you will have some net contribution. Uh, the Van der Waals physics is related to to quantum fluctuations. So you have your quantum state, which now is the quantum state of the fuel system atom, uh, atomic position, atomic degrees of freedom, and field. So you have the whole system. You have a closed system. You have the electric field, electromagnetic field, and the atom. And what happens is that depending on the pass followed by the atom, if it is pass one or, or pass two, the electromagnetic field and the internal atomic degrees of freedom will suffer the, a different quantum evolution, which is parameterized by uh, this trajectory, uh, R1 or R2. So we have two possible quantum states uh, uh, in blue and in red, uh, de depending on, uh, on the pass flowed by the atom. But of course, the few quantum states is a superposition of this. And uh, in quantum information, in the language of quantum information, we can say that we have an entangled state uh, uh, that uh, between the external atomic degrees of freedom and uh, the state of the atom and field, uh, the dipole degrees of freedom and one of the field. So uh, actually, these are the two quantum states that we consider that will produce uh, the dispersive phase. And the dispersive phase is obtained by simply taking the uh, dot product of this, uh, of this, of this state. And um, you work out this expression. I will uh, not go into the details, but to second order of perturbation theory, because to first order, remember that uh, the average values of the potential is zero. So to first order, you will not get anything. And when you go to second order, you have actually two possible choices. You can either take, take up two interactions in the same pass, for instance, two interactions here or two interactions here, or you can put, pick one interaction in each pass, one interaction here and one interaction here. So this is the first choice, for instance, and the second choice would be to do that. And oh, it should be V, not VR. Okay. Uh, and if you do that, uh, if you have, uh, if you if you pick up uh, these two, then you will have 
uh, a non-local phase, uh, and this is uh, a phase that actually involves two paths at a time, which is non-local. And now, okay, this will be the uh, more complicated, most complicated equation of this talk, uh, but this is only one that we will use, and I will try to explain the physics behind it. The total phase difference, the phase difference between the two paths when you work out this uh, theory, is a sum of local terms uh, and non-local terms, and uh, these local phases are similar to uh, the ones that we have seen uh, with the integration of uh, of the potential. Yeah. Okay. And these non-local phases are actually unusual, unusual and only happen because of the relative motion of the atoms and the surface. And each phase uh, is given by this integral, uh, which corresponds to linear response theory. And these terms are actually green functions for the uh, dipole and from the field. Uh, you have uh, relative retarded green functions, which are susceptibility functions, which correspond to the response and Adama green functions, which correspond to the source of quantum fluctuations. So uh, this uh, phase has actually uh, two contributions. The contribution which comes from uh, the uh, response of the electric field to the dipole uh, fluctuation and uh, the contribution here which, which corresponds to the dipole response to the electric field fluctuations. So, these are the ingredients uh, of, uh, of our phase. And if you take up the non-local phase, you will see that it is a difference between two phases, between two diagrams. Um, so here you have a retarded position, T prime, and, and a current position, T, a current time, T. So uh, the, in this non-local phase, what it tells us is that the two atomic wave packets, they talk together, uh, and there, there is a process between this wave packet on pass one and on pass, on pass two and on pass one, these two paths will talk together. And uh, here you have uh, a process which connects the two of them. And you have a time difference. Uh, to, you have a, vir a virtual photon exchange uh, through the plate. And the time to is the difference T minus T prime is a, is a typical time for a photon to go from this packet to the surface, to be scattered by the surface and to come back to the other packet. So of course, generally two is a very, very small time. So um, this is a very short time scale, but nonetheless, it is a finite time scale. And this is what will give us the effect. If you have no surface, then these two diagrams are exactly equal. And then you have, uh, they cancel exactly, and then you have no effect. Uh, so this is, you need to have a surface and the specific interaction to have this effect. And how do you treat a surface uh, in, in electrostatics? You, uh, in electro, you can, if you have a perfectly conducting surface, which is planar, you can use the image method. Uh, so that is to say, uh, the pass two will interact with the image of pass one and vice versa. So here you have a diagram which connects pass two with the image of pass one. And here you have a diagram which connects the pass one with the image of, of pass two. And because of the longitudinal, sorry, because of the orthogonal velocity here, which, has, which are different, there is a very small imbalance between these two diagrams. And this very small imbalance will result in a phase uh, which is given by this expression, which is a non-local phase. And here we have a fairly simple expression, which depends on uh, universal constant and on the atomic polarizability, which is our protein constant, and with, on the transition frequency. If you look at the ingredients, these are the uh, trajectories uh, uh, on pass one and pass two. Uh, Z is the uh, position of the coordinate orthogonal to the surface. And you see that this uh, phase is actually invariant in the time dilatation. And uh, so it does not depend on the atomic velocity. And it depends uh, on, the, on the modulus of the atomic velocity. But uh, uh, in contrast, it, it changes sign if you reverse the propagation. And these two properties are characteristic of geometric phases. So we have here actually a non-local geometric phase. Uh, so this is the first thing which is quite unusual for atomic interferometry. And if I go back to the uh, local phase now, which is more simple, you, can, you have two terms. The main term is the quasi-static term. And what is this quasi-static term? This is actually the expression of the, of the phase 
So remember, it is a second order diagram uh, perturbation theory. So uh, actually, there should be probably a factor two here, which has uh, disappeared. But uh, you have this expression, and V is a dipolar potential. Uh, the quasi static approximation is to say, look, uh, T and T prime are very, very close because tau is very small. So we can consider that this position, R of T prime, is the same as R of T. And if you do this, you obtain the quasi static phase. Which is the phase measured by uh, the group project Vigay, Conin, and so on. But if you want to go beyond this, then you will make uh, a perturbative expansion of the position in this time scale, and you get uh, this uh, phase correction here, which is uh, uh, you have done an expansion, and here you do uh, you have the gradient and so on, and you have a geometric integral along the, the path because you have you will have a dt which comes. Uh, which is a product of the velocity, so we get something which is geometric. And um, you have two ways to see this. Here, I say Berry is late. Uh, it is a bit uh, a kind of joke, but because Berry was not late, he was very much in advance of his time. But what I mean with this is that there is an equivalence or a connection be between the Berry phase and uh, the retardation. So uh, the quasi static phase is given by this integral of the potential is von der Waals potential. And the full Casimir phase actually, uh, using the expression here, uh, can be cast in a similar way. But instead of having uh, this potential, you have a coarse-grained version of the potential. And the coarse graining is done over a time scale, which is the virtual photon exchange. So what it, it means uh, is that if you want to have the rigorous expression of the uh, Casimir phase, you need to uh, take all the atomic position into account as the uh, atom moves during the uh, virtual photon exchange process. The quasi-static approximation is to freeze the atomic position. But uh, this is actually an approximation. The atom is moving. And because of this motion, you need to have this force graining, which takes into account all the possible positions. And it happens because you have a finite time in the, right, in the interaction. And of course, uh, this gives us dynamical uh, Casimir-like phase, which, which is the difference between the two terms. And these terms would simply disappear if uh, the, the time scale two of t were zero. So uh, in this formulation, it is, it is, a, it is clear that um, this phase, dynamical Casimir-like phase, is an effect of retardation. But we can also uh, say that it is a consequence uh, of quantum geometry and the geometric phase. And uh, geometric phase uh, are, are, are important in, very, in many areas of physics, uh, quantum mechanics, so it's physics are uh, extremely important nowadays. And uh, they explain in classical mechanics the, uh, the motion of the Foucault pendulum. And I will uh, recall uh, here what is actually a geometric phase, is this concept. So you have uh, an Hamiltonian, which we assume depends on a parameter. Uh, for instance, a vector parameter R of t, but it could be a magnetic field, it could be something else. But let's, let's take this vector parameter. Um, the eigenstate of this Hamiltonian, the quantum eigenstate, will depend on air. Uh, so you have uh, a set of eigenstates which is parameterized by air with an energy which also depends on the vector air. Now we assume that you we start with an initial state which is uh, one of these eigenstates, for instance, the eigenstate number n. Uh, and that parameter is uh, R of zero. And we assume that this parameter will evolve in time uh, in a gentle way so that we have an adiabatic evolution, uh, so which, which means that uh, the quantum state will follow the adiabatic state. We'll have no jump between uh, an eigenstate to the other. And this adiabatic evolution, uh, the quantum mechanics theory tells us that you uh, are proportional to this uh, uh, eigenstate. But you also acquire a phase uh, which has two components, uh, the usual integral of the energy uh, um, divided by h bar, which is a dynamical phase. And you have also an additional phase, which was discovered by, Ber which was discovered by Berry, which is a geometric phase, and which, which is the integration of this uh, Berry connection here. And actually, you should consider a closed uh, pass. Well. Uh, so in our system, uh, you have uh, we have an interaction Hamiltonian, which is a dipole uh, Hamiltonian, which depends on the atomic position. 
So in some way, if you consider the full quantum system with the, uh, the electromagnetic degrees of freedom, with the atom and uh, dipole and uh, uh, the atomic position is a classic aesthetic classically again, uh, you have a field state which is dressed by the atom and uh, the eigenstate depends on the atomic position. So our quantum system will be uh, the internal atomic degrees of freedom. Here, uh, these are the two states. You have a two-level atom, uh, so this is uh, this Hamiltonian. And you have actually also the electromagnetic field states, the usual basis with the usual standard Hamiltonian in quantum optics. Uh, and uh, when you uh, put up the two together, together, you have this quantum system with an eigenstate basis. Uh, with the details are not so important. It's just to, to put the idea is here. Um, okay, you start with uh, a lowest energy eigenstate because you, um, you have a ground state atom in the vacuum, and you have your atom which moves, but the atomic motion is is non-relativistic. So we'll have no atomic transition, and you will obtain an adiabatic. Uh, you will obtain an adiabatic evolution, which is a good thing to have a very phase. So your quantum state will follow adiabatically this eigenstate. And uh, when you compute this eigenstate using standard perturbation theory to second order, and when you compute your uh, Berry connection, uh, this is done in the paper that I will uh, in reference, you find that this geometric phase for the full quantum state is exactly the emotional correction that uh, I was talking about here. So in some way, for the atomic phases and the dynamical uh, motion and the motion of the atom with respect to the surface, the electronomic retardation and the uh, geometric gray phase are two, two ways to see the same thing. Uh, so this is a nice connection between these two. And now I will talk about the quantum Zaniac uh, effect. Uh, and uh, we will, we will put together all these elements. So first of all, uh, let me recall what is a Sennec effect. It was discovered by Georges Sagnac a bit more than a century ago. And it works for light waves uh, as well as for atomic waves. Uh, of course, at this time, it was, it was used for light waves. So we say, you, if you send a beam uh, in, uh, you have a beam splitter here, which spin, splits, you have an interferometer which, which splits this beam and two, two beams, which are recombined afterwards. And you assume that you will uh, rotate your interferometer with respect to an inertial frame. So what tells us this Sennec effect is that you have the appearance of a small uh, of a phase shift, which is uh, proportional to the uh, area of the interferometer and to the angular frequency of rotation. And this uh, system has nowadays many applications in inertial navigation systems, in aircraft, and so on. And uh, it is a geometric phase because it depends on, on the phase area and on the, it is proportional to the, uh, to the angular frequency of rotation. And it, actually, it works also with atomic waves. And it is even uh, stronger in this case. You have a stronger coupling. Uh, uh, so uh, atomic uh, phases, atomic wave, sorry, uh, feel the sonic effect more than light waves in some way. So let us consider an atomic deformator in the plane, if this plane, for instance, is rotating with respect to an inertial frame, you will have a Sagnac phase. Okay, this is the usual Sagnac effect. But what Ernst Mach would say is that initial effects are related to the motion of mass distribution. So what happens is, uh, for instance, we keep an inertial frame, but instead in this frame, we put, uh, uh, we put a particle and we rotate the particle. Will there be a, a Sagnac effect? Uh, this is actually uh, uh, a question if you put a conductor and the answer is positive, as we shall see. And this, effect, this question can be formulated uh, in a way that is similar to the Arnold-Bohm effect because uh, there is a similarity between uh, uh, rotation and magnetic field. Uh, the Lorentz force uh, is expressed in this way and the, in the rotating uh, referential with respect to the short frame, you have a coriolis force which has the formal analogy with the Lorentz force. So in some way, you can say that when you have a rotating referential, you have an effective magnetic field, which is given by uh, this expression. So what we are doing here is uh, to try to find the trace of the rotation uh, of, this, uh, of this particle in the inertial frame. Uh, if we formulate it in this way, uh, we are trying to find the trace of the effective magnetic field in uh, uh, in the rest of the frame. So there is a kind of connection between uh, this, uh, these two questions. 
Anyway, we want to find uh, a trace of the uh, particle rotation in the inertial frame. And uh, to do this, we will use uh, the same uh, tools as before. Uh, here, actually, uh, this font is bad. We, this is a uh, frequency of transition, it's a two level atom. Uh, I'm sorry about this. And we, this will be here the angular frequency of rotation. These fonts were not uh, good. But you have your Casimir phase, which has the same expression. So we can use all the same technique as before. But the hard, the hard question is to have the uh, electric wind function in presence of a rotating body. So this was the difficulty. I will not go into the details, it's not the object, but I will give you the ingredients uh, of how we did this. Um, the, electric, the retarded electric, electric wind function is related to the response, correspond actually to the response of a, an instantaneous dipole excitation. So uh, if you have an instantaneous dipole excitation at the position r prime and time t prime, and if you look uh, the field produced at the time uh, t at the position r, well, this is pretty much your retarded Green's function, and it is a way to compute this retarded Green's function. So uh, what is uh, important for us is this, the part which depends on the body. So uh, to do this, you have three propagation steps. You have the first propagation here, which is which goes from the uh, position to the rotating uh, sphere. Then uh, this deep dipole will induce a dipole on the sphere. The sphere uh, which rotates will, uh, uh, sorry, this, this dipole will induce an electric field on the sphere. The sphere will uh, respond and induce a dipole, and this dipole will radiate uh, a field here. So we have a product of three terms to obtain the uh, scattered Gates function, which involves the free propagation and the polarizability of the rotating sphere, of the rotating particle. And uh, to derive this pro probability, this was done in the work of Monja Bacas and, uh, in, uh, 10 years ago. And you can do this by switching to the uh, uh, rotating particle of frame and uh, switching back to the inertial frame, to the inertial frame. And actually, uh, what uh, this tells us is that you get, when you spin your, your particle, your conductor, you obtain uh, an anti-symmetric polarizability tensor, which uh, is proportional to the derivative uh, of the uh, material uh, polarizability. So if you want to have an effect, you need to have a rotation. It is proportional also to the rotation frequency, and you need to have a dispersive material. This, is, this makes some sense because for, for a, smear, a sphere, sorry, if you have a perfect conductor which rotates, uh, then you have nothing which happens by symmetry. But if you have uh, a polarizability which depends on the, on the frequency, then you have this uh, finite effect. Okay, these are the ingredients. Uh, you do the mass uh, uh, and so on. And when you, at the end of the day, uh, when you look at your local phase contribution, you have a local quantum Sagnac phase, which is given by this uh, relation. And uh, here we have the atomic polarizability, and here we have the second derivatives of the, of the material uh, polarizability. And this phase is actually proportional to a geometric integral here, uh, which uh, this is a main contribution in the Van der Waals limit. And you have also a, a small correction due to the finite speed of light. But actually, most of the uh, quantum Sagnac phase comes from the finite response of the, of the material. Because you have a dispersive material which is slow, uh, you have a, a finite uh, quantum Sagnac phase. I would like here to point an analogy with uh, geometric phases. If you, if you take, uh, here, this is our interferometer, which goes around the spinning particle. So uh, we have this uh, atomic wave packet which goes on the two paths. I should have explained that actually. And pass one and pass two, they are combined. And here you have a spinning conductor which spins very fast. And uh, if you have a closed atom interferometer, so it is uh, pass split here and recombine here, then you have a closed integral and you have an effective potential vector in some way. Uh, you have a geometric potential vector and an effective geometric field, which are given by these expressions. So here, uh, omega would be the uh, vector of rotation. And uh, in spherical coordinates, your, uh, uh, angular, your effective potential vector would be uh, perpendicular like this. And your effective field would be downwards like this, in the same uh, direction as the rotation, but with, but with an opposite uh, sense. 
And you have, legs, you have an effective length scale here, which is given by this uh, expression. And um, so you have actually in the end quite simple expressions. You can obtain other derivations of the quantum cyanide phase. You can obtain it as a degree phase uh, as before. And you can also obtain it in a, uh, with a instantaneous dipole dipole potential, which was done in our recent review. But uh, the main message is that this quantum cyanide phase is a degree phase, and uh, there is an interpretation in terms of uh, geometric potential. So you can look at the expression in some specific example, or some specific uh, trajectories. And uh, if you look at circular trajectories, then the quantum cyanide phase is equal to the local part. But if you go to linear trajectories, you have actually a contribution from the non-local term here, which I'll not go into details, but which is a sizable part of the uh, total quantum cyanide phase. Um, like uh, these are the local phases. And normally, if you had only no uh, local terms, the difference would be 90 here. But because of the non-local term, it is reduced to, to 63. So in this term, you have a non-local quantum cyanide phase. Um, OK, you want to, if you want to observe this, you want to have a strong uh, second derivative here. So in order to enhance the defect, in order to enhance this effect, you can consider use a plasma resonance. So you have uh, uh, two, a technology on um, quantum plasma resonance in order to have a, a, a more dispersive uh, function and a stronger response. So you should be close to the uh, plasma resonance frequency and slightly shifted. And uh, we have considered, for instance, sodium atoms and, uh, and uh, nanosphere of potassium for this purpose. And uh, you can use this to enhance the quantum cyanide phase. And finally, uh, if you want to measure this exponentially, you should try to estimate what you have in an atom interferometer. And uh, you have to take two things into consideration. Uh, first, atomic wave packets are not small normally. Uh, so you have to take into account the finite widths. And the second thing is that your quantum cyanide phase is not coming alone. It comes with a quasi-static term, which is, the one, uh, which is a leading order term. The, uh, and this will, uh, at some point, can uh, change a bit the expression for the phase. The, the total phase that you have access to is the sum of the two. Uh, you have a ge geometric phase, which is, again, independent of the velocity, uh, and which scales with the, uh, with the angular frequency of rotation of the particle. And you have a Van der Waals term, which is a quasi-static term, which is inversely proportional to the velocity and which is independent of the rotation. So in the end, you use this dependence to isolate the quantum cyanide phase here. And uh, when you put all these parameters together, you consider very fast rotations that have been obtained in the group of Hong Kong, for instance, a small radius of a few uh, dozens of nanometers, atomic winds, which are also very thin. You take high atomic velocities because if you have high atomic velocity, the static term is, uh, is smaller, so it is advantageous. And in the end, you obtain a very small phase, uh, but which is not so far away from the uh, um, state of the art in atomic interferometry, which is a quantum cyanide phase of uh, a tenth of mini radian. So this has these two uh, figures here. Uh, if you have the velocity, the phase depending on the velocity of the beam for a given uh, width, and uh, the phase against the uh, width uh, of, the, uh, of the beam for different velocities. And it's always better to go to fast velocities, actually. And you go up to this uh, uh, phase of uh, uh, one of over 10 radian. OK, so this is a pretty much the conclusion of my talk. Uh, I apologize for showing up of showing up so much equations to you. Uh, these are uh, my colleagues who have done a big, well, everyone has been uh, essential for this work. So Renaldo is a professor at the Federal University of Finance. Uh, Paulo uh, is at the Federal University of Rio. And Guillermo Costas was a PhD student who uh, did big part of this work. And uh, as a conclusion, uh, I would say that my, the microscopic theory of the dynamical casin can predict important features of the dynamical Casimir effect. Uh, so with a very simple toy model, you can obtain a lot of ingredients, uh, a lot of characteristics of the dynamical Casimir effect. Uh, the center of 
a mass atomic motion leaves uh, a trace as a geometric atomic phase. Uh, so uh, this is a consequence of the this is this is a like Casimir effect. We have seen a connection between electrodynamic perturbation in, in very phases, and uh, we have a, we have seen a quantum fluctuation analog of a Seniac phase. And uh, these are the references uh, of this work. Uh, recently, we have put a review on the archive, uh, which sums, uh, which is, uh, which follows basically uh, this talk. Uh, and these are the previous publications. The most recent is related to the quantum sonic effect. So, uh, thank you for your attention. And in the end, I would like to say, well, now that uh, the pandemic is uh, lighter and you have uh, vaccines. Uh, be very nice to see some of you in Rio, so don't hesitate to come and visit us. We have uh, uh, often uh, PhD position available, postdoc, and even faculty position, which open up regularly. So, um, also for a simple visit, the region is beautiful, and we can come and discuss. Uh, it's quite far away from Singapore, and it's not of the jet lag, but okay. <laughs> so, this is pretty much it. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Francois, for this very nice talk and then uh, all this concept that uh, we are not necessarily familiar with here. Uh, very interesting. So now uh, let's wait for questions. So it's always difficult for the start for the first question. So maybe I, I, I can ask I can ask the first question. I have a few questions, but I, I will ask. Uh, the first question. So, uh, in in the really uh, beginning of your talk, when you talk, I mean, when, when you introduce your model of, of of dynamical Casimir effect, so you take an atom, you consider here uh, somehow a scalar um, interaction, right? So you have a two-level system only on your atom. Uh, so I was wondering if you now take something a little bit more realistic for atoms, let's say a g equal zero to g equal one transition. I mean, does it change something uh, uh, in, in, in the way that, 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 that the, the light is radiated? And uh, a question related to that also is that now, if you consider that uh, the things is also immersed into a static magnetic field, uh, I think that should, should change also quite a bit. Do you have any, uh, uh, any um, thought about that? Uh, look, um, the Actually, you can extend this theory to, uh, to multi-level atoms. Uh, it is a, it's a good question, actually, because uh, uh, it's a good question. It's a good critic, criticism to our model, because- No, no, it's not a criticism. Do, it's just- <laughs> no, no, no it's, I know it's not a criticism, but uh, I, I, um, I would say that uh, it, it is a, it's a very good question because uh, when you do laser physics or physics in the resonant cavity, you have a, a well-defined frequency, which is the frequency of the cavity. So here you can very work very well work with two-level atoms, which is uh, the famous uh, formalism of dressed atoms by Cohen-Tanuji, Sarah Roche, and uh, so it's quite defined. But in the Casimir physics, really, uh, Casimir physics is a broadband uh, phenomenon. Yes. You have to mm -hmm. take into account all the frequencies. So in some sense, uh, it is not so nice to, to use uh, two-level atoms, and maybe it doesn't make so much sense. It is indeed the simplification that we have used, but uh, you can uh, take the multi-level atoms, uh, the multi-level uh, into account, and it does not change uh, the, our conclusion in general. Uh, you can extend without much difficulty this formalism. Actually, in the review that we have done, we, uh, we use this uh, we explain this uh, uh, this point. Uh, now we have not plotted out uh, the uh, the quantitative features of, of the difference. What I can tell you is that uh, 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 actually this uh, two terms are very important because there is a paper which was published in New Journal of Physics after us, which took the same potential but without the magnetic term. And they found out that they, it was different. So they see the thing was they did, but in, uh, actually it is, uh, the spectrum is different in, if you don't take the, the wrong term into account. Now for multi-level atoms, uh, we have not studied this quantitatively, uh, but maybe uh, the expressions are the same, but maybe when you 
do the whole computation, it changes a bit the spectrum. Uh, I have to say that uh, we have not done this, but formally it, it is quite a lot, like quite similar. Uh, well, well, yeah, what I want to say is not, not, not necessarily, con uh, I mean, considering all the spectrum of, of a realistic atom, I was just wondering, I mean, I was just considering just a single transition, but instead mm -hmm. of having two level system, you have a G equals zero to G equal one transition. So you know three exactly well, state and then you can. Uh, it would be interesting to see what happens in this context. If you have, for instance, a triplet uh, of, uh, of uh, or really to be uh, different. And also for the quantum scenic phase, you can also uh, generalize to multiple atoms, to multi-level atoms. Uh, the formalism is, uh, is quite uh, similar. And, and a question related, I mean, you, you partially answer to this question. I mean, if you take the, the, the two terms that you have when, when, when you do the, uh, relativistic boost, uh, I mean, the, the, the electric field and, and the, the, this term, yes. Uh, 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 I, uh, then if you look to the emission of the atom, so it's mainly uh, coming from, from the electric field contribution, or, 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 or I was the feeling that if you take the, the uh, transverse electric contribution, it's mainly from, from the front gain term, but maybe I'm wrong. When you, when you look at the uh, I'll be honest, I don't remember very well, but I think that it is important indeed to retrieve a feature, which is one of the features that you have more transverse magnetic photons emitted than transverse electric photons. Okay. I, I uh, really believe that if you don't put the magnetic terms here, you don't have this feature, for instance, uh -huh. which changes the spectrum. Now, I, uh, I don't remember so much uh, what if it, if it is related to the transverse electric spectrum, if they want to game, if the magnetic term has an influence on the transverse electric. I guess it has, but I don't remember, to be honest. <laughs> okay. Uh, the hero of this work was Renaldo. Uh, uh, Renaldo was actually the, the main contributor to this work, I have to say. Uh, it was a PhD student at this time. Uh, but yeah, I don't remember if it is, uh, but you, you have different results if you don't take the rotting term into account. So it is an illustration in, in which it is important in this case to take it into, into account. Uh, to estimate this effect. Um, it's probably strongly the, depending also on the acceleration, right? If you have, a, if more, more deeper you go to the relativistic case, probably more of this term is important, I guess. Uh, okay. Uh, yeah. I guess it depends on, uh, on uh, Yeah, on V because there is a, there's an amplitude here. Uh, okay, I, I have other question on so transfer, but maybe uh, uh, I, will, uh, I will ask if, uh, someone has a question also? I don't want to uh, take all the time for-, uh, for I, my... I hope that I have not uh, terrified all the students with mass and <laughs> complicated the questions. <laughs> yeah, yeah, sure, sure, sure. Yes, yes, yes. But, uh, the, um, okay, so I, 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 have another, I have another question then. I mean, in general, I mean, when, when you talk about uh, uh, geometrical phase and that that's was I mean really true in, in the the second part of your talk when when you you have the max mm -hmm. interferometer I mean you 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 say that okay the phase is non-local uh, actually it, it's, it's also uh, something that happening if you just consider the normal and round bomb effect uh, where you you can have two interpretation uh, so you know, I mean, you have the infinite long solenoid, and then that's really the the, the, the experiment of an And then you can say, well, uh, uh, actually, the phase is non-local if with respect to the magnetic field, because I mean, of course, you are in a region where there is no magnetic field. But but uh, if you consider now the, the 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 gauge field, I mean, the vector potential, then the, the things become local again, because then when you do the calculation, you do some integral. Over the past, and then you, you consider locally the you know the, the the vector potential everywhere. So I was wondering if in your in this case here there was not I mean another way uh, to reinterpret the the the, the, the geometrical phase uh, how, I mean coming from from the equivalent of a vector potential somehow, and then then you go back to some locality. Uh, yeah, probably uh, there is probably a way to to obtain it as a, we actually think there is a way to obtain it as a very phase uh, also in this case uh, yeah. and uh, but there instead of having a, a parameter which would be a vector you would have two vectors uh, 
So you have, uh, so it is a possible, uh, but it's still an open question to us. Uh, but I guess, yes, you can derive this, interpret this uh, monocole phase, maybe uh, through uh, different vector potential, or maybe as a very phase, but which depends on two parameters, which would be the two uh, positions. Uh, mm -hmm. But it is not clear yet. Uh, if it works out or not, we are, we are working on it, on this kind of interpretation. It's a very good question uh, because you have all the features of the geometric phase. It is, uh, so there should be uh, an interpretation in terms of geometric potential maybe, or yeah. also for this non-local term. We have worked this for local terms, but non-local terms, it's still, uh, it's still open uh, as a question. And so, but we have been looking in the literature about non-local geometric phase, and we have not seen uh, actually something in this one. Uh, but, but, so yes, but, uh, but, but that's true. It's, it's, this term is a bit uh, unusual in the sense that, it, 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 I mean, it's, it's, uh, it's due to a non-retardation effect, right? So it's due to the fact that, yeah, yeah I mean, when you come back, the atoms has moved. So, so somehow, you know, there is um, here uh, uh, some kind of non diabeticity in some sense, uh, uh, which so we should uh, depend on the velocity of the atom, uh, and that, that's a bit unusual. In fact, in, in the geometrical yeah. perspective, uh, I mean there is there is some some kind of uh, adiabaticity condition behind, so such doesn't explicitly depend on the time. So it's a bit different here. So that that that's that's very subtle. It's, it's very nice. Yeah, here we we are actually non adiabatic. Uh, we do. Uh, First order expansion in the dipole and the velocity, but uh, yes, it's true. Well, the only thing we assume, I would, I have not talked about this because I don't, don't want to be too technical, but we assume that the field is at the thermal equilibrium and you use a fluctuation dissipation theorem in, in the way. Mm -hmm. uh, but, uh, but uh, well, <laughs> it was already complicated enough to, to explain this. I didn't yeah, sure, want sure. to go into these details. Uh, um, but yes, uh, that would be uh, a possible way. Uh, we still uh, hope that uh, this phase would be measurable in some in some uh, in some way and find a, a material which can produce a stronger effect. This is one of these of our uh, lines of research, uh, or looking for different geometries, for instance, um, which could produce a, a different or stronger effect. Right? This is a uh, um, this is a problem of dynamical Casimir effect. These things are very small. <laughs> yeah, sure. No, you should discuss with people that doing uh, interferometry with, with, with atomic beam, you know? I mean, there, there yes. were some people in Toulouse to it. I, I don't know what if they're still doing this or not. Uh, I mean, there's few groups, but that, I mean, using this kind of system, probably it's, it's the yeah. most suitable for, for you. Yeah. Yeah, of course. Uh, I would like to discuss with Alexandre Gauguet and uh, with Toulouse about right, this. Okay. Uh, he was. Uh, he has done some work on geometric phases, and uh, with uh, and uh, yeah, uh, that uh, would be one of these uh, possible extensions. We um, really like to go to something measurable. This would be the, uh, a very nice conclusion for for this work, but we have to work a bit more, I guess. Um, and. Um, Okay, so uh, uh, I mean, time, time is running. Usually, it's, it's only one uh, one hour. But so, if if there is another oh, okay. question, I don't want to. I was a bit longer. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no uh, uh, Is there any question? Okay, so if there is no more question, thank you very much, uh, uh, Francois. Very nice talk. Very nice work. Thanks for to you for the invitation. Uh, you you really welcome. Pleasure. Yes, uh, yeah. I hope to see you uh, one day in Singapore or in Brazil yeah, or, or in France. In France or in Singapore. <laughs> I, uh, well, uh, thank you very much, uh, David. And uh, well, uh, uh, I wish you a nice day then because it's uh, your- It's early morning early for us, yes. <laughs> in the morning. Uh, uh, and good night for you. <laughs> <laughs> thank you very much. Bye-bye, Francois. Thank you. Bye-bye. Ciao, ciao. Bye -bye.